So I'm going to start today with uh, going to go over a bit of a review of, of, of session one fairly quick, but just since it's been two weeks uh, since we did it, make sure that to hit the main points again um, and go over go over. We went over these a bit before, but go over in a bit more detail some of these these bread and butter uh, descriptive plots that that we use the frequency tables, bar plots, histograms, box plots, especially that are used all the time for describing data numerically. Going to introduce a few measures of center, the mean, median, mode. Um, actually, I think I'll mention, uh, oh yeah, also the spread, the uh, interquartile range and standard deviation variance, and give you some graphical examples of those as well. And even if you've heard of them, maybe give you a little bit better uh, intuition for, for what exactly it is they are. Let's start with a bit of a, a review. Um, the population and sample have, have special meaning in statistics, um, and the population being the entire group of interest that includes all individuals or all, um, all records or observations or all possible records uh, that could be observed as part of a study. And then a sample is a subset of that population that, that um, we want to make using a systematic method and where every individual in the population has a known and non-zero probability of appearing in that sample. So it doesn't have to be an equal probability, but the probabilities have to be known and it has to be non-zero for everyone in the population. We're doing a lot of descriptive statistics these first uh, couple, of, couple of lessons. Um, both numeric summaries and visualization. This is a real part of statistics and, and how you should start looking at any data set that, that you start analyzing before doing any, any inference. Um, and then uh, finally, inferential statistics, which is what much of this course will be a, a, about starting after uh, in the next uh, couple of sessions where we take our limited information from a sample and make inference about the entire population. So the variable is something we measure. It's something that uh, some attribute or property uh, that is reported for each of the individuals in the study. And we covered these, these uh, main types of variables, the nominal variable, which included both binary two level and category that were categorical that are three or four, uh, three or more levels. Ordinal variables, which are, um, uh, actually numeric, but they're just, the, it is the rank that is important. So they're still uh, not really numbers. They just, they're, they're like nominal variables, except that they have an order to them. And then we talked about discrete and continuous variables, which I put together here as quantitative variables, because they often that distinction between discrete and continuous is not very important unless the numbers are very small, like one, two, three, four, five. Um, but what they have, in common is that rules of mathematics apply. You can add them, you can subtract them, et cetera. They're, they're actual real numbers. So for the nominal and the ordinal data, um, we use frequency tables and bar plots. The frequency table is just a table that uh, lists the number of each of the categories that, that we have for a single variable. It's a, uh, um, a one row frequency table. You can make it for two variables. Those are called contingency tables. Um, and the bar plot is just a, a, graphical, uh, a graphical presentation of the same thing. The pie charts, statisticians don't like, um, except this one. This is my favorite pie chart I've ever seen. Um, and it, it's, uh, it gets, gets right to the point. It's probably the most direct way of, of uh, presenting the, the data of how much pie I've have eaten. But even there, I can't really tell what proportion of the pie this, this is that I've eaten. I know that, that I've made a good dent in it um, and that I probably can't share it four ways anymore. Um, but I can't really tell if that is, I don't know, six or 40% or 30%, something like that. I don't know, guesses. 30%. 30%? Okay, maybe. Um, I don't know. I guess here it was uh, it was thirty five percent, and so this is a more quantitative but uh, more boring presentation of the same data. So sometimes the pie chart has a use. 
<clears throat> um, so just as an example, we have 40 students, four received an, an, an A. Uh, we can represent this as a frequency, which is the counts. That's what goes in those frequency tables. Proportions or relative frequency, that's a number between zero and one, and percentage is that multiplied by 100, so it's between um, zero and 100. And you can use any of those in your, in your bar plots or in your frequency tables. In fact, it's pretty common to show both frequency and proportion or percentage in, in tables uh, summarizing your nominal data. For quantitative variables, um, there are these three different, I mean, there are more than these, but these are some of the main ones. Uh, ordered here in order of from the most detail at the top to the most um, the most summarization at the bottom. So the dot plot actually shows every individual data point, and it often puts a little bit of jitter in it to uh, just keep them from overlapping on each other. But it's just a plot of all the individual data points. Uh, the histogram does some categorization first, converts your quantitative uh, data into an ordinal. Uh, into an ordinal variable so that you can order them on your, your histogram and put bars. So it's like a bar plot for, uh, for categorical data. And the box plot is a combination of qualitative and quantitative measures put in the form of this, this uh, box and with whiskers. And the things that we look for in all of these are generally the central tendency where the middle of the plot is, the shape of it, including spread and skew, and the presence of outliers. So this is a dot plot. Um, in this one, uh, some binning has still been done to, to stack them on top of each other. So it's not quite, it's not exactly putting um, the original data, but you still see every individual data, data point. So it's like a histogram, just very detailed. The familiar histogram. Note that that so here this this uh, weight data has been binned into um, about let's see these are about twelve. There's three per fifty, so there's about twenty or seventeen pounds per bin, and so you've created all of these seventeen pound bins and then counted the number of people in, in each one of those bins, so giving the frequency on the y-axis here. But that same data set can look very different depending on the width of the bins that, that you create. So very fine bins with just a few pounds in each one looks different than with, with coarse bins. So this is, this is it's important to remember it's a, it's a summary of data and as and as necessary for any summary there's some subjectiveness involved in it and you could miss things or highlight things depending on how you how you choose to bin the data there are always defaults in software um, and they're usually pretty good defaults but uh, there are cases where you can miss certain structure in the data using the default the default bins When we're looking at histograms, um, again, we're looking at these essential aspects of, of, the, the, um, of the continuous data, including um, the center of it, where sort of most of the data lies, where the histogram is higher, the spread, sort of how much it is spread around that center, whether, you know, how many pounds variation around the middle there is, and the, um, the shape of it. Is it symmetric or does it, how, does it skew one way or the other? Symmetric distribution, of course, is one where if you put a mirror in the center, it looks essentially the same on both sides. And the left skew is one where you see a lot of uh, additional data over towards the left, the much longer tail, and right skew to the right. Some examples of that are lifespan. So if you look at how long individuals in, in most populations live, you'll see a few individuals who die at a very young age, um, but not that many. And then you see a lot of people who die at about the same age here in the middle, and then people don't live very much longer than that. So that's a left skewed distribution. 
a very good example of a right skewed distribution is incomes where you have, you know, you can only go down to zero. So there's not too much of a left uh, tail on there. And then you have a lot of people sort of at the lower end of the income distribution. And then a very long tail as you get up to um, university presidents and CEOs and, and things like that. Those were what I call single mode or unimodal distributions. There's just one main center of the data and everything is spread around that. Um, but that's not always the case. You, um, you can have a bimodal distribution or even a trimodal distribution. Um, and in the, um, this is usually some kind of indication either of, of it's not really a single population you're looking at or there, there's some there's some important factor, like a binary factor, that is influencing this outcome. For example, if, if we were looking at um, at weights, if we had um, if we had collected our data from an elementary school and from I don't know a um, and a heavyweight boxing school, you have a, a bimodal distribution because there's that heterogeneity in the population. And an outlier, there's there's no there's no precise definition or precise and agreed upon definition of an outlier. There are plenty of definitions of outliers, but not that, that everyone agree on. But in general, it's just some data point that falls far away from, from the rest of the data points. Um, there's one definite, the definition used in box plots is that it's more than 1.5 times the interquartile range outside of the box. Um, sometimes there are outliers defined based on the z-score, which we'll get to of individual points. Um, but all of those are just ways of quantifying something that is really a qualitative observation that this data point doesn't really look like it fits with, with the rest. Um, and you know, this distance between the next one, what is an outlier on a symmetric distribution like this might not really be an outlier if this were a skewed definition a skewed distribution. If it's right skewed, you'll expect more points over on that right hand side. Yes? Do you make arguments as to uh, some, whether something's skewed or whether there's an outlier? Like is there, Sorry? Like, is there definitions used particularly to say something's an outlier as opposed to skewed? Are there definitions? Um, not really. I mean, there are tests of distributions. There are statistical inference tests to say, um, you know, to, to say whether something appears to, un, under a null hypothesis, come from a normal distribution, that you, you can devise tests of, uh, of symmetry by the, the fraction of, of points to the right and to the left of, of the mean. You can, there are, um, non-inferential tests of skew, such as the difference between the mean and the median. Um, but really, it's an, obs it, it, it's, an, it's an observation, like the, the um, So one paper could say distribution skew, while another could say there's an outlier, or would they define that in the paper? Most of the time, it, it would, they would show a histogram and say there appears to be right skew. So um, there are measures um, of, of, of skew that, that, that you can report. There's a skewness statistic that you can report. Um, it's generally not recommended that you report p-values for those kinds of tests, uh, just because from the same distribution, the more data points you have, the smaller p-value you will get for the same amount of skewness. And generally, for, for a large data set, you can any small, you know, any small deviation from from the distribution in your null hypothesis will give you a small p-value. Um, so, so the what what I would recommend is showing the histogram, and then there are statistics called um, called skewness and kurtosis, which has to do with the the, um, the thickness of of the tails, uh, which, which you can report if it is important to, 
um, to, to your results to actually quantify the skewness. Usually what you're looking for is, is it normal or not? Good question. Um, and as a note, it may or may not be justifiable to remove outliers. Outliers can be there because there was a problem in your data collection because someone wrote a one and it looked like a seven or something like that. Um, or it can actually be, um, it can be a part of your distribution um, that, and just something that, that is a part of your data and, and that you can't just throw away. It's a sign that your null hypothesis is incorrect or there um, are, there is something that you don't know about your population. Just a reminder, you know, this box plot, um, it shows a lot of information on a single, uh, on a single plot. So showing the density, the density line here, which is the probability of a continuous value taking values between any, um, any range of the continuous variable um, with, the, with the box plot of it overlaid above. So you have this thick middle line at the median, the value where half are above and half are below. Then the box extends out to the first quartile and the third quartile so that that difference between them is the interquartile range. And then these whiskers, they extend either out to your furthest data point or to 1.5 times the median plus 1.5 times the uh, interquartile range, um, depending on what, whichever is uh, smaller. So in this case, there is um, an outlier. So we know this is going out to all the way to 1.5 times on this side, there are none. So this might not actually extend all the way out. It won't go beyond the furthest data point. Make sense? The very nice thing about box plots is that they make it easy to compare two distributions side by side. So this example here, the heights of males and females um, allows you to see that, that um, on average or kind of in the central tendency, uh, males are taller than females. But there's a certain amount of, uh, of overlap between those two distributions. Um, and by the way, there are additions to the box plot in some software that will allow you to do things like change the width of the boxes to show how many observations are in each of them, and also to put little notches on, on these boxes um, such that if they, over, if they don't overlap, then it's a, probably a statistically significant difference at the 0.05 level. Okay, on to numerical, numerical summaries. Um, here I'm talking about the central tendency measures mean, median, mode, the um, measures of various different points in the distribution as quartiles, quantiles, and percentiles, the range, extreme values, and, um, and standard deviation, as well as some other measures of spread. The mean, which I suspect you're all familiar with, just the sum of all of the values divided by um, divided by n. This is um, using the capital sigma notation um, to represent the sum. Mean is is a very convenient measure to use, and we use it all the time. Um, but it is best in distributions where you don't have outliers and don't have um, strong skew because it is not resistant. It's affected a lot by outlying values. And I'm plotting here, um, I'm plotting here four different, uh, four different distributions. So we have a normal distribution on the left uh, and what I'm plotting is I'm overlaying on top of the box plot uh, the, the regular three points plus this red bar, uh, which shows the mean. So the black one is the, 
um, is the median and the red one is the mean. And looking here, it kind of, I'm just looking, it does look like the, uh, well, uh, it's a little hard to tell if the whiskers go exactly out to a data point every time. It, it could be. Um, but here I've, I've overlaid the, um, I've overlaid all of the individual data points uh, with a bit of jitter, like I mentioned. And uh, here you're seeing them twice because this, the big circles here are a part of the box plot. These are the outliers. And then I replotted all of the, the data points using the small, the small black dots. And they're just moved side by side, side to side a bit by this uh, jitter that I've added. Um, I've, I've put some, some R code uh, with the session, with the lesson at the end, um, in, case, in case you want to be able to make this. Um, but you see here the normal distribution, this is a symmetric distribution, and the mean and the median overlay on top of each other pretty well, perfectly. The log normal distribution is one where if you take a logarithm of it, you get a normal distribution. Um, and it is a strongly skewed, uh, it is a strongly skewed distribution because it's like a normal distribution where you've been exponentiated everything. So we have lots of what appear outliers on a box plot and a very big difference between, um, between the median and the mean. The exponential distribution, just exponentially distributed. So it would be the exponent of a, of a uniform distribution. Um, less skewed, but uh, still skewed. And you see this smaller difference between the, uh, the median and the mean. And finally, a uniform distribution. This is generated just so that the, the values are, are equally likely to be anywhere between um, minus two and, and two here. And it's symmetric, so there's not very much difference between the median and the mean. Is, are, are there any new distributions here to anyone? Have, have you, is any, if anyone uh, unfamiliar with the log normal or the exponential distribution? I just wanted to ask quickly about yep. is resistant, same as robust, correct? Same thing, same thing as robust. Yeah, it's it's not robust to outliers. Um, I'm not resistant. Yeah, I mean the same thing. All right. So the median is just the, the midpoint of the observations. If you have an odd number of observations, it's just uh, the middle one when you rank four of them. If there is an even, um, and this is one definition, the average of the two middle observations. It turns out that actually there are a bunch of different ways for calculating the median in this case. Um, and if you use the function in R, it gives you, I think, seven different options for how to calculate the median if you look in the help page. Um, and there's one of them that will give you the same answer as SPSS. Uh, the, these differences you only really notice with a small number of points. If you have four data points, there can be a pretty large difference in the median, depending on, on how you calculate it. If you have 100 data points, you won't notice the difference. Um, but it's also the 50th percentile. Just um, few examples here, one, two, three, four, five, the median is three. We replace the five with a billion, it's the same. So that's what I mean, it's very, re it's resistant, it's robust to outliers. Um, and if we get rid of that five, it changes a little bit, it has to be somewhere between two and three. Um, my other favorite example for today, the seven dwarves, the median is just uh, right there, if we have them rank ordered in terms of height, it's the middle one. And if we replace one of them with a basketball player, it doesn't change the median at all. So the mode is the most common value and it really only makes sense for categorical, um, categorical, ordinal, um, maybe binary data, really for categorical or ordinal uh, data. And when we talk about the mode, 
in a continuous distribution. It is entirely dependent on how the data are bin. So in this example, our mode is right here, whatever the second bar is. Um, but if we, if we were to change the width of these bars, you could end up with a different mode. So getting back to your question about a, a numeric um, or some kind of a quantitative summary of skew, uh, this is one way to do it, that, uh, that in skew distributions, it brings apart these three measures of central tendency, the, the, the mode, the median, and the mean. And a fairly common measure of skewness is the difference between the median and the mean. So if you have a mean that's larger than the median, it means you're right skewed. Your mean is less than the median, you're left skewed. And the more skewed it is, the bigger that difference is. Is there a number that they can be used as far as that difference goes? I guess it would be proportional depending on the time set is. Um, well, we'll have units. So, yeah. so um, you know, it'll be in the same units as whatever whatever you're measuring. But I don't think there's a number that above which you say it's a skewed distribution. Um, it, it, that's better for comparative purposes, I think. If if you're, uh, you know, if you have, if you have a bunch of different distributions or something, you could order them by skew just just using using that difference. But that's not a statistic that I would probably report in a paper. That would just be exploratory. Um, so the peak percentile, percentiles are the percentage of the data that fall below P. Uh, so the, the 90th percentile um, would be the, the, the value below which 90% of the data fall, um, which could be another measure of, of skewness if you were to look at the differences between, between each of these percentiles, you would see increasing uh, differences between the percentiles as you got further to the right on a right skewed distribution. Quartiles are just special percentiles. They're um, the ones that split the data into four equal four parts, the 25th, 50th, and 75th percentile. So. The median is that second quartile, the 50th percentile, um, and the first and third quartiles are the ones below which 25% and 75% of the, of the data fall. So here's an example of, of a distribution split into, into three quartiles. This being a skewed distribution, you see how this, uh, um, there's more range of values to the right of Q3 than there are to the left of, of Q1. Range one more is one more uh, measure of spread, and it's just the difference between your most extreme values. It's the difference between your largest value and your smallest, uh, your smallest value. So it's a useful thing just for describing the total amount of variation in your data set. Um, but of course, it is strongly affected by outliers. And it's also strongly affected just by sampling, whereas something like the average is fairly stable under repeated sampling um, and becomes more and more stable as you get to larger sample size. The range is unstable, as are the max and min. The more data you collect, the more it will keep changing. So it is, it's, it, does not necessarily get more stable as you get to, to larger sample sizes. So here the range would be difference between 25 and 100 to um, so 150. Variance and standard deviation, we calculate these by, by you first need the mean, you calculate di the difference between um, each individual data point and, and the mean, you square those, um, and then you divide by depending on, 
whether this is a population or a sample, um, you divide by n or n minus n minus one. Um, this s squared says this is from a sample, so I'm dividing by by n minus one. Um, the reason for this is that is that just as a hand waving explanation, in a sample we are calculating this x bar from the sample, and so because you calculate that in the place that minimizes these deviations, you will tend to get um, too small of a value for, for this. And if you divide by n, you will underestimate your variance. And it turns out if you divide by n minus 1, this is the number of degrees of freedom in this statistic, you get an unbiased estimate of the, the population variance. If this x bar, what would we call this if this if this were something known from the population? What would I use instead of x bar? Mean. Mean? Yeah, how would I represent it? Can you remember this? Like a Greek letter. Greek letter, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can't remember which one. Mu. Mu. Yeah. Yeah. So if we had mu and we use this here, then this would be divided by n. Even if, if these, these x's are from the sample, if we have the population mean, then we don't need to make this correction. This correction is here because the mean is estimated from this sample. Yeah. OK. Um, just to kind of highlight what uh, emphasize these deviations and the square deviations, I actually plotted some of them. So from each of these four distributions, I have plotted the, the population mean. So this is, um, this is, no, sorry, I, I actually calculated the mean from, from these samples here. And then calculated the differences between each data point and, and that sample mean and put that in red. So you can see um, that it depends on where your mean is and, and how far each of those data points is from the mean. And it's positive or uh, negative, except for the, the, um, for the log normal. Oh, it, I, I just plotted each of these from, from zero in, in these two cases, not from, not from the mean. So these are deviances, and here are the squared deviations. So whereas here on the normal, the largest deviation is about 2. Now it's up to over 5, and you just see how, how a lot of them are really small. And especially in this really skewed log normal distribution, most of the data points just look like right down around 0 with a couple of them really, really dominating these squared deviations. So you know, this one data point here is contributing um, almost as much to the, to the um, total deviations uh, in the log normal distribution as, as everything else uh, combined. Whereas, in the uniform, where there are, you know, the tails are perfectly flat, there isn't even, um, you know, it's a very compact distribution. You see, there's that they're pretty well evenly distributed um, between between zero and three. Just a few notes about standard deviation. It has the same units as your observed variable, so if you're measurements are in pounds, your standard deviation is also in pounds. Um, it's a measure of the spread of the data such that if it's zero, that only occurs if every one of your observations is the same. And as soon as there is any variability in your observations, two values that are not the same, then it has to be greater than zero. And the more spread there is around that mean, of course, the larger the standard deviation gets. Um, it is not resistant or robust to outliers or skew, so why do we use it? Why, why did I start out by telling you about standard deviation 
if, if, it, if it's not robust to these things. Yeah. We well, just said it in the prior slide that it is convenient for describing normal distribution. Exactly. Paying attention. Thank you. Um, yes, it's very, it is convenient for describing normal distributions because it's one of the two parameters that define a normal distribution, the mean and the standard deviation. We work with normal distributions a lot, even when we don't have perfectly normally distributed data because of something that we will get to call the central limit theorem. So it's a very important distribution for analyzing all kinds of data. Um, on this one, I have added a little bit more decoration to that to that box plot. So before we had the um, we had the mean and the median, and then I've just added to this the mean plus or minus one standard deviation as the narrower red line, and plus or minus two standard deviations um, to, uh, to to the plot. So. Um, on the normal distribution, you see them, you know, the one standard deviation is kind of like where the, the boxes are, the interquartile range, and two standard deviation is, is kind of about out to where, to where the whiskers go. Um, but uh, in this log normal distribution, all bets are off. They're, they're very different in, in the two directions, can't even see the the um, mean minus two standard deviations here. Um, and just like the mean, they're influenced strongly by outliers, but even influenced more than the mean. Is. So here you see the mean only goes up about that much, but the two, the two standard deviations is really affected a lot more than the mean by the skewness of this distribution. There are some alternative, more robust measures of spread, the interquartile range that I've mentioned, which is just the, the um, difference between those two, uh, the width of the box and that box plot, the third minus the first quartile. Um, the median absolute deviation, or the MAD, is, is actually a reasonably commonly, well, IQR is, I would say, the most commonly used alternative measure of spread, maybe followed by, by the, the MAD, um, which is, is similar to the standard deviation for a normal distribution. It's just the, in, instead of um, um, wait, this should be, this should be squared here, sorry. So it would be each individual observation minus the median. Um, sorry, this should be the absolute, the absolute value here. So this needs to be the median of the absolute values of x minus the median of x, so that they're always positive. I wonder if I can write that on here. Hmm. No, I can't. Sweet, I'm sorry, it's the median multiplied by that difference? Um, no, so you just, for you calculate the median of all your data points, and for each individual, you take, you take that observation minus the median, take the absolute value of that, and then the median of all of those absolute values. So, so you need your median, you need the absolute value of the differences from that median, and then you need another median. Questions? And where does that second median come from again? Sorry. The second median? Yeah. Okay. The, so it's the median deviation from the median. So your first median is just the median of all your data points. Like if, say we're talking about age, it's your, it's your median age. Um, and then everyone's individual age, you would subtract that 
from the median and take the absolute value. So if the median is 30 years old, someone is 25, the absolute value of that difference is five. If they're 35, it's also five. So it doesn't matter whether you're above or below it. So for everyone, you calculate that absolute value of how far they are from the median, and then you take, calculate the median of all of those. So that's a, a robust alternative to the standard deviation that, that has about the same amount of spread for a, um, a normal distribution. Um, so it would work even if it was skewed? Yeah, it, so it would, it would be, be it, it would, I mean, it would still be a bit affected, affected by skew because skew does, you know, if we look at uh, here, you know, skew does still affect the median a bit, but it's much, much more resistant to skewness than, than the standard deviation. And yes, you could still use it for, um, for a skewed distribution. Of course, for a skewed distribution, um, any measure of, of spread isn't going to tell you the whole story. It's not telling you that you know there's more spread on the right side than on the left. It's a measure of spread around around the median. So you know it's a measure of spread around this point here that's not exactly a you know, it is one center of the distribution, but it's it's a partial story. If you have a skewed distribution, it would be better to use the NAD than a standard deviation to describe its spread. Finally, of course, the range, this very non-robust non um, measure of the total variability of the data. All right, just to, so you have it on your slides, a summary of all of the, the things that we have covered today that you should remember, um, things that you should be familiar with before your first exam and that you'll go over in the assignment. Um, I did, by the way, put both these PowerPoint slides and a PDF, a four per page version of them uh, on Blackboard. And as soon as we have a um, an industrial type printer here. I'm going to start printing those notes and bringing them into class. Um, all right, I'm going to wrap up here. Any questions about uh, any of the stuff we've done today or about the class in general before I give you a little bit of a break and we go into the lab? <laughs>